All right, hello, and welcome to the Yet Another Value podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Walker, and with me today, I'm excited to have the co-founder of InPractice, Will Barnes. Will, how's it going? Good to be here, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for coming on. Uh, let me start this podcast the way I do every podcast, and that's by uh, pitching you, my guest. Uh, you know, I actually met you through your site, In Practice, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a second. Uh, I've enjoyed talking to you. I've really enjoyed being a user. And I, I think one of the first premium beta, is that right? I'm one of the first premium beta That's subscribers right. over there. So uh, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, normally, you know, I'd give a pitch and then I'd dive into the company. But given that in practice kind of a, a startup and you're the co-founder and you've got a little bit of a different background than most of my guests, I thought, why don't you go, you know, a minute into your background, a minute or two into what in practice is? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short so we can we can dive into the the, the more exciting stuff. But so I did, I did a short stint on the buy side, working at a family office after studying, based in London, doing a lot of mid cap, small mid cap private and public deals, um, and then I moved to was eventually working for a fund, and then eventually met my co-founder who was actually working at one of the large expert networks with Fordbridge, and he was the first employee. Uh, kind of commissioned to build out the content offering, which today is called Furbridge Forum, which is the, I guess, executive interview product. Similar to what we do today, where we had analysts internally that were interviewing executives, packaging them into a subscription and selling them online to the big PE funds, hedge funds. Uh, I, I actually started in, um, well, I, I, long story short, no, sorry, long story short, and I met him, uh, we kind of hit it off talking about manga and random you know, psychology books. Um, and I joined Furbridge, actually started on the credit side of the business. So I was working in distressed debt um, and European high yield to begin with. Done that for a few years, studying crappy businesses. I always like to say I've had my time studying those those businesses and eventually moved over to, to look at public companies. And 2019 come late 2019, and we decided to jump ship and start in practice. And really what we do now is, is we look to study high quality companies, um, you know, with a help, a bias towards kind of mid cap or small mid cap companies uh, in the US and Europe um, that we think can be, you know, 10x or higher over the next um, you know, five to 10 years. So we, we study those businesses through conversations with executives. Um, right now, we, you know, most of the interviews that you'll see on there, the ones that we host internally, um, but going forward, we are rolling out a premium service, which you are a part of, Andrew. Um, and, and that will be more of a, a kind of complete service where, you know, you can go on there, you can request new projects. We will do both one-to-ones and group recorded interviews um, that we host internally, but many investors or multiple investors can attend uh, to learn. And then we're going to try and build this into more of a community of high quality investors and experienced operators to learn about these businesses. But let me ask you one question, the kind of marketing for practice. So I'm going to throw you a softball here, right? Like, uh, you know, I think if you're looking for expert networks like GLG and Third Bridge, those are the two, uh, the, the two longest tenure ones. But that's generally like a private equity firm with borderline unlimited due diligence is going to do one on one calls with executives like that, right? Yeah. So for most people, you know, nine, maybe a couple of the funds and people who are listening can afford that. For, for most people, that's probably not limits. But for you guys, right, it's a little bit lower price point. Everyone gets access. What separates you, you know, there, there are a couple of other competitors who are doing a similar startup where, hey, it's, it's, it's expert network calls, a couple hundred or a couple thousand dollars for a year. Everyone gets access to transcripts. What do you think is kind of different about you versus the rest of them? Well, just before we discuss that, I think there's an interesting point that you hit on because I think if you look, and I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but if you look at the history of the expert network industry and those businesses were built, for example, Furbridge was started by two Bain consultants. So those businesses are structured, GLG, Furbridge, Guidepoint, they're structured in a way to mainly serve consultancies, you know, McKinsey, Bain, BCG, or, or private equity funds mainly, which are, you know, they have a pitch that comes on their desk. They have two weeks to get their act together because they need to put a bid in or a yep. month to get together. So they need to do 100 executive calls and, and, and commercial DD to actually understand the asset to then make a bid that model is not necessarily fit for purpose for someone like yourself or, or, a, or an equity hedge fund or, a, you know, a quality fundamental investor who doesn't have to find out to, you know, what the valuation of this company is in a day or two, you know, a week. Um, so those businesses are somewhat not fit for purpose for the 
client base that we're going after, which is a typically a, a small to mid-sized, you know, equity long short hedge fund that cares about understanding these businesses. And so what we what we focus on is really aligning ourselves with you, i.e. The, the customer, and, and trying to really help you understand how these businesses work. And so not just going, okay, here's an executive, here you go and, and go and speak to him. We look to work with you, you know, what we do that now. So, you know, we do most of the interviews where we solidify questions from yourself and other users, um, and we host them internally to make sure that we can curate the narrative around the company and make sure we can you know, explain them in a, in a great way possible. And then going forward, what we think is different is, you know, we wanna, we wanna build a trusted community where executives come to share their knowledge in certain ways, but also you guys and ladies come to the platform uh, to communicate with other investors, to study these businesses um, and to join group, you know, more high quality conversations with executives that we host internally um, uh, as a group as well with investors. Yeah, ju just one thing and the, the, I'll, I'll give you an advertisement and then I'll, we'll move on to the thing. But like, obviously I was reading your Naked Wine transcript. You interviewed the CEO, I think in November, 2020. Uh, so I was reading that to prep for this podcast. And one thing I liked, it was, you know, even when you're, I, I've done some competitors where, you know, a hedge fund guy would be interviewing the executive. And a lot of it does seem to focus a lot more on, a lot of the competitor products seem to focus more on the short term, like, hey, are you going to make this quarter? Are you seeing pricing pressure right now? And that sort of stuff. And what I loved about the interview was uh, it was much more long-term focus and everybody's got different things, right? Like if you're focused on a quarter, that's fine. But for me, I generally focus on like, hey, what's the industry? What's the strategy? What's the long-term of this? And, and I like that your questions were clearly you were familiar with the industry and it was much more, hey, how is this going to evolve over the next three, five, seven, ten 10 years? So anyway, that, that's enough of an advertisement for in practice. I would say, let's turn to the company we want to talk about. Uh, this is Naked Wines. It trades on the London Stock Exchange under W-I-N-E, wine. And uh, also, I believe it's in the U.S. under M-J-W-N-F, which used to be Majestic Wines. So I think the M-J is kind of a legacy of Majestic Wines. Uh, Naked's been a very popular name with a lot of very sharp, small cap growth investors. Um, you know, Elliot Turner, who's come on a couple of times this podcast, he, he's mentioned it several times. He's a very sharp investor. Everyone knows I very much respect him. That's probably enough background on Naked Wines. Why don't I turn it over to you? What is Naked Wines? Why are growth investors so excited about it? I think, well, I mean, in a nutshell, Naked Wines is a, a kind of vertically integrated e-commerce model that produces, distributes, and sells exclusive wines online. And that's the nutshell. But I, I think what, what's interesting to look at this business is to go back and look at the history. Um, it was founded in 2008 um, and then, you know, the reverse takeover of Majestic Wine in 2015, which was a which is a brick and mortar retailer of about 200 stores in the uk eventually naked spun that out to elliot in 2019 for over 110 million pounds um which then just left the naked pure online business to be to be listed um but the, the i think the history of of naked wine is important to understand which provides context to the culture and the values of the business and, and the business model design so it was actually started in 2008 um, by a guy called Rowan Gormley, who we've interviewed as well. Um, and and his, his profile is interesting as itself. I think that's re one reason why I came across the company. I, I read an article in, in the press in the UK um, from him, looked at his background and he, I mean, just as him as a person, he, South African, I believe, um, was an accountant, then worked for a UK private equity fund, Electra Partners, which is somewhat well-renowned in the UK. Um, and then he... He actually met Richard Branson, who then wanted to hire him and hired him at Virgin. Rowan inside of Virgin created Virgin Money, which does over 2 billion revenue today, I think. And, and then he went on to start Virgin Wines within Virgin, right? And so that as a potential profile of an outsider is pretty interesting, right? So you've got this guy, accountant plus PE background. So reasonable assumption to believe he understands capital allocation. Um, and then you've got Branson clearly saw something in this guy that was unique, hires him into Virgin, starts Virgin Money, two billion revenue business. Now he's onto wine. So like that kind of piqued my interest, like why I was in wine. So I started digging around. Um, 
and then found that his communication style was pretty unique. If you go and read his old Cheryl letters, they're, they're, they're really interesting and you know, simple but powerful language. And then, you, you know, they actually, I think 2015, 16, Wine actually showed their cohort charts. And back then, I mean, that no other yeah. e-commerce business showed their cohort, cohort charts. So I was just like, looked at Wine's numbers and, and their charts and cohorts, and then just didn't realize why no one else done the same. And so that was just somewhat interesting to me. But in terms of how the business started, you know, 2008 founded in you know the middle, of, I think it was December 2008, Rowan said he started it, which was you know, kind of peak um, you know, financial crisis. Why make a strap for cash? Um, and they couldn't fund their new productions. It ties up too much capital for too long, right? And obviously these, you know, the wine production process, long production cycles, uh, you know, I guess capital tied up, more incentive also for winemakers to pick the grape early, which reduces the quality of the product. Um, you know, and so Rowan really, what he'd done was actually get the customers to fund the, the grape. So, direct, so it was almost like a crowdfunding platform to begin with. And I think there's an FT article years ago, you can search for it. It's like called the Kickstarter, of wine Kickstarter, right? Yep. So, so really what it was is that he... And what he realized, if you speak to Rowan as well, he said that, you know, what he realized was that when he pitched wine as a product, he got a certain level of engagement. When he pitched the winemaker's story, yep. he got a multiple of the engagement from, from consumers. And so what he learned, I think, and what, what he's built that business around is that, you know, there is humans love stories right and, and his character as well and he, he the way that he builds that business is around the human connection of the consumer and the winemaker not the not the consumer and the product and and that was really interesting because a huge behavioral element to the business that is really important that angels and it all, got, it all ties into how they're you know why they're called angels and why it's called naked but it's the the consumers are effectively funding a human and, and their story to produce a product that they purchase. Right? And the beauty of the model is, as, as actually the, from the business model design perspective, is that you have negative working capital because they're funding it up front, and the winemaker has effectively sold the wine before they've even made it, which is what is the case. So let, let's back up a second. So I, I think what happens is, and I, I'm just clarifying business model um, that you're on. So Will is a winemaker, right? He wants to go out on his own but it is expensive to make wine, right? Like you need to get the grapes, it's gonna take months for them to develop. Once you get them, you've got to smash them, you've got to bottle them, all that type of stuff, right? So that's a very time and money intensive process. So if you're a small startup winemaker, that's tough. And there's a lot, as you said, there's a lot of incentives to cut corners, right? Pick the grapes a couple of weeks early, the grapes aren't as good, but you'll be able to tur tur turn it into wine and sell it quicker, right? So what Naked does, they say, hey, Andrew is a consumer. Will will put his story onto the Naked Wines website and if Andrew likes the story, likes Will, he'll give Will, he'll pre-commit to buying a bottle or a case or whatever of Will's product. Mm -hmm. And because of that, Will gets the cash up front. So Will can take his time. He's, you know, he's no longer at the risk of, hey, if I make a hundred bottles, what if I only sell five? What if I, you know that you've got demand for the thing. So you can take your time, make the thing. And the consumer gets get this, this story and they get to, as you said, they're, they did the kickstart of wine and they can go to their friends and say, Oh, this bottle, let me tell you about it. I funded the winemaker. He was a really interesting guy. You know, maybe he's former military or maybe he, he was an accountant who just loved wine and started up his own wine company. Am I thinking about that correctly? Yeah, so uh, yeah, exactly. It, it's, a, it's a, you know, simply it's a payment subscription model, right? So you have customers that subscribe 20 quid or 40 bucks a month into the piggy bank, their wine piggy bank, effectively. That capital then is used by Naked Wine as as, as cash flow to finance the production of their winemakers grape, right? So, so they say to the winemaker, we've got a scaled customer base, which is why scale is really matters. We've, we've, we've aggregated demand. That demand is, is funding their piggy bank. That piggy bank money then is what we use to fund your, your production of your wine for as long as you like. That means that the winemaker gets to focus on their craft specifically gets to maximize the quality of the, the wine, gets to also take risk on new types of wine that they might not have to before. And so then you get a situation where, you know, it's kind of win-win, right? So the consumer gets to subscribe to a business that, you know, the, the company uses the capital 
to to fund the winemaker to focus on the, the quality of the wine which then flows through you know, because wine naked wine is a listed well it's, it's it's a like i said it's a production company a distributor and a registered winery in the u.s which makes it able to retail with the product it um you know it gets to capture margin at each part of the value chain um, okay. and then produce the product and give the product to the customer at a lower price for similar or, or better quality so let me, let me, let's first, like, I guess the first question when I hear this is competition, right? Like last night I went and I Googled wine subscription service and I got, I think Naked Wines was the third, third one on the Google advertisements or whatever. The first one was wine.com. There was Sherry, Sherry Lehman, I think. And there's also like, I think Wink is a new subscription service that has something similar to Naked Wines and stuff. So when I think about this, I mean, obviously the angel side of it is different than what a lot of these other things are, but you know, the first thing that pops in my mind is a couple of years ago, Blue Apron was this hot meal kit stock, right? They came out and within three months, there was competition on all sides and Blue Apron, you know, it's the classic, if you had credit card data, the moment that, um, the moment competition came out, you saw that Blue Apron was in a lot of trouble. So when I think Naked Wines, I, I do, there's more regulatory stuff and we can, we'll talk about the regulatory stuff in a second, but I, my first thing is, how is this going to survive competition? Why is this not, you know, if I invest in this, why am I not a year from now writing to my investors, hey, this was Blue Apron 2.0 and I should have known? Well, there's, there's two, well, there's three things, which also I kind of outlined the core tenets of an investment thesis really went. The one is the, the value chain economics, right, which we can talk about in a moment. The second one is the scale benefits and the design of the business model. So again, Wink and these other wine clubs are wine clubs, they're not naked wines, completely vertically integrated model, yep. right? Where they actually work directly with the producers, fund the producers, own the grape contracts, wink pretty much just buy the products, relabel it and sell it onto the consumer. Yep. So they're, they're different. It's not exactly apples to apples in terms of the, the traditional wine club business and, and naked wines. And I think that's an interesting point because a lot of people think, oh, this is just a wine club, but I mean, wine clubs have been around for over 20, 20, 25 years, right? Since the late nineties. And, and what they historically have done. And I think you, you know, I spoke to Luke Jex, the former international CEO of Naked and also Rowan about this because they also remember in terms of what they learned about, they run Naked, they run Virgin Wines, right? Rowan used to run Virgin Wines, you know, and something went on there and he ended up leaving, but he really struggled with that business for a few years before getting it right. And the reason why is because they wasn't, integrated mainly with the producers and they had a lot of churn right and the reason why because these wine clubs you know typically what they do is they they go and partner with a company that has a large email list and they say right i'm going to now sell wine to all your customers on the email list and we can share and you know we can pay you a fee or a part of the margin and so we go and procure wine from producers package it up into a subscription and sell it online, right? Mm -hmm. Then you also get this adverse selection point or, you know, where it becomes attractive for that wine club to then package stuff and relabel it in certain ways and then bolt them together to sell different wines to, to customers, which causes lots of churn. So you, what, what Naked does is they, they look to integrate with the producers, which, which smooths the production volatility, which reduces the unit cost and makes it easy to manage. And they made it into a payment subscription model where you can then go on and choose the wines that you like. And hopefully they're, you know, they're, they're wines that have, you're paying for a higher value, high quality products because they're reducing the cost. But that, that's, I think there's, there's three things to, the, to why this is different. I think there's the value chain economics, why wine is different to other categories, which we can talk about in a moment. There's uh, the scale benefits, which I think is somewhat undervalued or underestimated in, in Naked. And there's the behavioral element where well, we can just talk about the, you know, the, the, the industry economics is also one thing that I found particularly interesting, especially also if you compare the UK and Australia with the U S which is very, very different, right? Where yeah. Yeah. the UK and Australia, you have very consolidated retail. I think the big four in the UK is like 75% market share. Australia is even similar. Um, so what you have there is a very price driven market here in the UK where, you know, most of the bottles are sub seven pounds, Na you know, Naked actually sells sweet spot wines, they call them, which is eight to 12 pound bottles, which is actually more expensive really than Tesco or Sainsbury's, right? 
when the, in in the US is very different because of this free tier structure. Yep. Right. So what you have is more power. I think at the more at the producer level where it's more it's more consolidated. But if you just walk through like the economics, um, you know, of, of of basically producing a ten dollar bottle of of wine from the producer, and then how much would that actually cost the consumer? It's about double, right? Yep. It, even more than that, really, for a $10 bottle of wine from the producer. And you can see in their old Capital Markets Day 2016, I think you can see, and if you go and look at there's a, there's a, there's a listed winery, I think Willa Med is called in Oklahoma, I think, in the US. And what they do is they, their cost structure is roughly 60% gross margin, so 40% COGS, 40% SGNA, and then 20% net margin, roughly. Mm-hmm. So they're spending exactly the same 40% on both cost of goods and the production of the wine and the liquid and the quality of it and marketing and overheads, right? So, so, so the same amount of money is going into both of those. And that also weighs up if you look at the industry structure where if you assume that the producer has a 20% net margin or 60% gross margin, right? So they're selling, you know, they're selling a 10 bottle, 10, dollar bottle of wine to a distributor like sovereign glazers for example let's say that they have a 25 percent gross margin minimum i think on on spirits they will have so then they sell the product to you know 13 14 dollars to the retailer i mean a big retailer or a small retailer will have at least 25 30 percent even higher in in wine gross margin again so then you get a you get a consumer price for a ten dollar bottle of wine from the producer like 20 25 bucks yep right that, that's, a, that's a lot of value that you're missing out there. And what, and what, what, what Naked does, which I think is really interesting, is they, they are a registered winery. They produce it, they distribute it, and they, they sell it, and they cut out that margin. So if I'm just thinking about this properly, if I, if, again, in our example, Will is the winemaker, right? It probably costs you $10 all in to make a bottle of wine. And then what you're going to do is you'll probably sell that to a distributor for $20, and that distributor will, you know, he'll, he'll get it to a retailer and the retailer will sell it to the end person for 25 to $30. And what Naked does is they say, hey, we've got, we don't need to pay for marketing. We're going to send it directly. We, we own our own distribution. Obviously, there's some expenses in that, but we can cut out a lot of this superfluous stuff and we can buy the wine from Will for $10 and then we can sell it to our consumer for $16 to $18 versus the $25 they would pay in the uh in the prior example and they can do this because they've already got all the money they've got all the subscription they don't need to market to their current base right because their current base is already paying them and everything so obviously there's expenses up but they're they've cut out a huge amount of middleman costs am i thinking about that correctly yeah exactly and they and you know and the, what they always claim is that like and what rowan used to say as well is that again if you look at again the 40 percent cost of goods for the for the producer, right? Selling the $10 bottle of wine. So let's say there's four, four dollars of product production value and liquid in the in the actual bottle that's selling for $25, $20, $25, right? So you've got a huge amount of the actual value of the bottle that's eaten up by the, the value chain, like the distributor, the retailer, stuff that doesn't actually add value to the product. So over over 80% of that is actually not creating value in a sense. This might be too in the weeds and tell me if this is a crazy. Uh, a, a crazy worry, but I do worry like part of it, right? I, I look, everybody loves DTC stuff that cuts out the middleman and cuts out this huge waste. But I do wonder if like, like it is illegal. I cannot get a bottle of wine and ship it to you in London or to my friends in Chicago, right? Like I don't have an interstate alcohol license. I believe I can't ship alcohol. Med- Naked wines, because they are a winery, they can ship. But what they're doing is they're going to other wineries and they're basically shipping the wine for them, right? So it, Am I crazy that this is like, there's a little bit of regulatory arbitrage that has some risk long-term or am I thinking about that wrong? And again, well, this is in the weeds. So if, I, if I'm off, just- no, that, that, It's a good question. I think, you know, they've addressed this before management. They say that, you know, the, 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 according to the US regulation that they, you know, if you're a registered winery, you can sell, you can sell wine, right? So I, I think there's, what it comes down to really is, I think the, the essence of the business really comes down to the fact that they don't need to sell the wine because they have a scaled consumer base. That's really what it is, is that, is that they, they, they aggregate demand. I mean, like any e-commerce business online, right? You have to have scale to aggregate the demand to drive volume 
and then what happens is it's really you know the, the second part of that is you get scale economy shared effectively when you have this yeah. scale so you have over a million you know if you get over a million angels you can then you know basically sell higher volume per SKU, right which for the winemakers then means you can increase your you can amortize those fixed costs of you know longer grape contracts procuring barrels or other dry goods larger tanks yeah. um, that can reduce your unit cost that then actually you share between yourself the winemaker and the customer I, I think one great example they said was hey if you're going to hire a great winemaker right if i'm going to hire will it, it's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars per year 200 whatever a hundred thousand dollars per year if I'm only making a thousand bottles, well, then uh, you know, will cost a hundred dollars per bottle. But if I'm making a hundred thousand bottles, now will cost a dollar per bottle. So you do get that scale benefit, and it, one winemaker can obviously scale up. Do you think we've done a good job dis uh, discussing the the economics of the business? Because I kind of want to dive into opportunities, risk, and everything. But if you think there's something we've missed on the business, I'm happy to go back and hit that. Well, I think that that's. I mean, one. One question that I always had, you know, was really just the uh, how much does scale actually matter? Okay, yeah, please go. No, and, and and it's it's what's quite interesting is also to and we can talk about valuation and stuff later on, but what I thought was quite interesting was was really just kind of comparing wine to other kind of vertically integrated models, like I don't know, Carvana or I mean, Hello Fresh. I mean, Blue Apron. All those kind of milk kit providers, good food, um, and and there's it's interesting when you look at the differences because again, wine is is a producer, effectively a distributor and a and a retailer, and they also operate in an archaic free tier system that enables them to capture margin at each point. Whereas the Carvana, for example, they have to purchase vehicles and off lease vehicles. Um, which they don't get that much scale advantage from than, than others, just more ca capital. Um, and then they have to kind of, you know, maybe they have more cyclical residual values in cars versus versus wine. So it's just interesting to compare the differences. And even, even HelloFresh, right? So for example, you know, HelloFresh procures food from farmers, um, you know, then packages the food in, in, into, into meal kits and sells them online. Whereas... Naked Wine effectively has more of an emotional feel about the company, right? So you don't you don't fund the white the farmer necessarily, where you fund this put this winemaker individual. I mean, you go on go on Naked Wine. You have this like winemakers have like nearly over a million, you know, half a million up to a million ratings and and fifty thousands, fifty thousand, hundred thousand followers and stuff. It's like there's a mini social network within Naked Wine rather than just I'm buying a HelloFresh milk kit. You know, it's a very different emotional behavioral side of the business that I think is particularly interesting. Let me but ask you about that social network, right? So you're, Will, last year, we, Naked Wines, we funded you, we angel startup you, you know, we did, you did a, a, a thousand cases. This year you did 50,000 cases, right? Because our people love you. They can't get enough. They're putting in huge orders, right? One thing I worry about for Naked Wines, and this will come, come back to some of the other risks I'll talk about, but like I've started, I've started Will up. Will built his system on Naked Wines. He built a brand. What's to stop Will from, hey, now that, I've, now that I'm selling 50,000 wines, I've got all these loyal customers, what's to stop you from going direct or really big wine competitor comes in and says, your wines are great. Yeah, it's great that you're selling directly, but you know how you'd really make money? If we bought you out and we put your wines in every Kroger or in America or something, right? So does Naked Wines have any ownership of that thing or is there a risk that, hey, they're always funding these small wineries and they can make a nice business of that. But every time a winemaker kind of gets big, they go out and do their own thing and Naked Wines doesn't capture that upside economics, if that makes sense. So to my understanding, the way the winemaker relationship, works, and there's different types of winemakers, right? They, they're, sometimes they can be small wineries, sometimes they can be individuals from the big businesses like Constellation and such. Um, but really the value comes, and going back to the wine production process, you need to fund, you need capital up front to not only fund the process, but then also to market the product at the end. So if, you, if they were to go on their own, they need to have a lot of capital to not only fund the production, but then also market their brand internally online or you know, wherever they need to. Mm -hmm. So, so it, again, it, and it comes back to scale again, the, the, the fact that 
the reason why Naked works so well is because they have scale and they can effectively say to winemakers, your wine is effectively sold before you, you produce it because we have this payment subscription model. So it's, I don't think that's more, I think that's less of a risk in terms of winemakers going elsewhere. Um, we can get onto risk in a moment, but I think they're more just down to execution as always and you're not, not getting too far ahead of themselves, I guess, like, like Blue Apron kind of did. Okay, so let's say, I mean, I think at this point we, we've laid out a clear picture of why this business has advantages, right? Like, again, this it's more U.S. focused and that's probably because I'm in the U.S., but they've got advantages because their cost structure is just so much lower than the kind of three-tier system where people go and buy that all the cost that builds up from when I go and buy from the local liquor store, right? So let's, let's assume- That's what makes it so interesting, right? Because if you think about it, if you think about the difference between the UK and Australia, like Naked has got to- you know, Naked has over 300, 350,000 members in UK, which is a price-driven market owned by retailers, right? So the grocers here own, own the majority of the market and they're price-driven. So if I want to buy a bottle of wine, I can go and buy it for five quid, four quid, six quid in, in Tesco. Naked wine is actually a more ex relatively more expensive or higher quality product in the UK. Whereas in the US, it's, com it's completely different because of the structure of the market, right? You have, like I said, more consolidation of producers, more fragmented on retailers. Yep. And therefore you have a free tier system, which means is actually naked but could become, you know, which is part of the issue, part of the mistake they made in my opinion, is they come into the US and said, oh, we're cheaper than everyone. And everyone's like, well, I don't want to drink you then. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but, but the fact is that the, the actual value proposition changes. And that's the other thing going back to comparing it with HelloFresh, right? And so this is why I also find naked so somewhat more attractive or very different than the likes of hello fresh and 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 other vertically integrated models because the value proposition is so much higher because they because of the structure of the industry because of the scale benefits whereas hello fresh you know the customers seem to be paying on convenience more right i, I pay to be delivered that when i you know every every day or every week whereas naked is it's you get a higher quality product for the same price or less I like what you said earlier where, look, HelloFresh, it's nice if you're funding a farmer, right? But nobody's going to come to you and say, oh, yeah, I, you know, these tomatoes come from Will. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, Will's this farmer and I read a story and, I, and now I'm giving you Will's tomatoes. Nobody's going to do that. But you can form an emotional attachment with wine and the winemaker and stuff. So I do like that. But let me, let me come back to that risk I, I talked about from a different angle, right? Like when I think craft beer, you know, for a while, everybody loved craft beer. All these craft beers were going to kill Budweiser, Bud Light, all that sort of stuff. And they took a lot of share, but the end game for every craft beer company was Anheuser-Busch, Budweiser comes and buys you, plugs you into their distribution and professionalize you. And a lot of craft beer drinkers didn't like that. But if you want, were a craft beer that wanted to kind of, you know, grow bigger than a lifestyle business, that was the end game for you. With Naked Wines, uh, you know, is there a risk that they're only going to be able to do these small, these small wineries that people really like to angel invest into stuff. And that's nice. And that's a great business and they can make a lot, but there is a cap on it because they're never going to be able to distribute, you know, the, the 200,000 cases, or they're never going to be able to meet the needs of somebody who, you know, I don't drink a lot of wine, who, who just wants to go get two buck chuck or alternatively, the person who wants to get the, the collector, you know, like who wants to know this is a 2014 vintage. The collector model doesn't really fit with the angel, hey, prepay for your wine and I'll deliver it to you in six months and you you don't know the quality in advance. Does all that make sense? Yeah, but the way I look at this is the, is the size of the market and how to segment the market. So mm -hmm. I think it's about $20 billion in the US. I think three to three and a half billion is like above $30 a bottle, right? which, is, which is the you know, probably the most of the people on Twitter that we speak to, you know, and have a higher, more expensive taste, right? Where the majority of the market is below $30. Now, you know, I think that, and going back to the scale benefits, because one of the, one of the questions that comes up and one of the, one thing I've spoke to management about is, you know, the free tier system in the US, that means your contribution margin could be much higher, right? Because you can effectively capture margin in each part of the value chain, whereas you can't do that. In, in the UK uh, and Australia. And I think there's an important point where you can go and move, your, even capture more margin or move up the price points right now, 
But if you believe that the scale economies work like matter and that you can share them with the consumer and the winemaker, because like you said, you can get, you know, more, if you sell more bottles per, per skew, more volume per skew, you benefit from these, you know, you leverage your fixed costs more to amortize them over more bottles, which reduces your unit cost. So you can get, you know, buy longer grape contracts again, procuring barrels and dry goods and that, that type of stuff. Um, if you believe that, then you should be going after the and the seventeen billion dollars, right? You should be going after the, the the core of the market, which means actually there's no there's no somewhat limit on on wineries producing cases, right? Because as long as you have the demand, you can just upscale and, and go to production facilities. And you're seeing that already. The I think one one metric the management look at as well is the is the revenue per winemaker, right? And that's gone up over the years. Yep. So, so they actually move winemakers from smaller facilities to bigger ones as their as their skew as the demand scales, right? So uh, it's not crazy to think in the long run that the, the individual winemakers can grow, but also they can start working with much smaller wineries as long as they're on the exclusive contract, which Naked t- tend to work with, right? Because that would be a big risk to it. They just go and like start selling other people's brands and become more of like a marketplace, which would probably lose that feel of what Naked actually is. Could they Could they become a marketplace? I mean, I think that, and again, I'm focusing US here, but I, I think the regulatory structure would preclude them kind of becoming a marketplace like that, right? Wait, if they want to ruin their business model, I'd suggest they do that. Right? I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, again, it, again, I guess it goes back to what you believe Naked is because going back to the story of how it was founded, right? Naked is built on the human connection of the consumer and the winemaker. If you, and this is going to be the risk, right? Because management, as you aggregate demand, you can do a bunch of stuff with it, right? You can sell ads, you can sell other products, you can bolt on new things, you can, you do what you want, right? Which is, which is kind of the risk if you don't, if they're not focused on yep. their so, values and what they believe in. So do you think two, three years from now, if I'm a Naked Wine Club member, do you think there'll be a $250, $500, $1,000 bottle of wine on the site that I can go buy? If they wanted to, but why would they want to? You've got, you know, they do 180 million in sales in the US and there's $17 billion in, in, in market value below, below $30. Like, why don't you, if you believe scale, scale economies work in this business and you want to share them, then you can, why don't you go after that? And that's also one of the issues that I have, not issues, but one of the questions I've managed, like why aren't they going more aggressively in the US and spending more? And that's, we can talk about that in terms of the history of Naked in the UK, but if you do believe that there are real scale of benefits in this business, then why don't you go after the core of the market, own the core of the market, scale your, your, your customer base to million, two million users. You can always then go and, and, and go in the premium site. Now working on Wine Genie, I think is a kind of premium, personalized premium service where you can buy more expensive bottles and they're working with Jesse Katz, which is more expensive wine. Mm-hmm. But I think they should, it's always, you know, it goes back to this, like something to Costco, right? Like why, because why go, Costco obviously fixed their gross margin effectively and then the money, you know, their loss leaders and the merchandise at 12, low, low gross margin. And they, they earn their cash flow on the memberships, right? Like when I see Naked in a similar way, right? Why don't you fix your contribution, your repeat contribution margin at 27, 28%. Right? And, and just go for scale. And then you can feed that scale through into the, into the, into the product, which makes it much more, more valuable and more attractive than, than competitors. And that's where the advantage comes from, right? It's, 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 the, scale, it's the scale benefits, if you believe that exists. Right? Let, let's talk about another scale benefit. So I, th- I think I've pushed on some risks, but let's talk, I, I think one thing, maybe even understated among investors is, uh, they're getting a lot of data and a lot of interesting, and you know, Reading the 2020 annual report, it, it, it was like catnip for, for growth investors, I would say. You know, they talk about the scale, they talk uh, our digital business is nothing short of revolutionary as a direct cl- quote, prior to long time over short term. But I do think that data and scale that scale data benefit they have is interesting. Can you talk about how they're using data to kind of benefit their business and everything and how that separates them from a lot of subscale competitors, competitors who don't have this data? I don't think they're using it as well as they could be, to be honest. It seems like, I mean, if you think about the, what you can do with that, and again, it depends on, 
you know, it depends on what you can do with that. Obviously, you have good customer data to understand what they want to purchase. Um, but the issue comes in the business is like retaining those. So obviously, with any D 2 C business, you know, Naked, HelloFresh, they lose a, a large portion of their customers in the first year, right? Yeah. Um, which is also part of the reason why I think, you know, even I got this massively wrong with HelloFresh, right? I, I, I looked at HelloFresh three, four years ago and was like ran, ran when I saw their, their churn, right? And, but what I missed was that their, the retention like almost is super fans. And, and with the high order value um, and the, the retention, you get a huge lifetime value and cash payback. Look, this is, this is what people miss with Shopify, right? People yeah. say, oh my God, the, the Shopify churn in the first month, first year, whatever, it is off the charts. And that was actually a good thing, right? It was startup, it, Shopify is different than HelloFresh, obviously, but it was startup businesses who are coming. And yeah, it's a startup business. A bunch of them are going to fail. But what's really important is a bunch of them are going to succeed. And once they do, look at the retention and the lifetime value on those that are going to stay. But anyway, keep going, keep going. Yeah, and that's also like what the... I mean, I, I didn't I massively miss that with HelloFresh because of the fact that the order, average order value, I mean, the what is it, $100 over there for, for a meal kit per week? And if you have someone re that retains, you know, even six months a year, you've got huge lifetime value and cash payback on that. And and so N Naked, in terms of their their unit economics and, and, and the way to look at that, I think, you know, one thing is that you, you can look at their old cohorts and see that the the kind of retained contribution profit over time was very high, right? And, and that also shows that as these cohorts mature, effectively they start to purchase more. And as you said, back to your data point is that the longer you have a customer, the more data you can leverage, right? And so the more data you have, the more you can personalize the experience, the more you can offer them better deals, the more you can retain them more. So, and I think what you were seeing as well with the, with the cohorts, the sales retention is very, very high and the contribution profit is almost hundred percent on those old cohorts. If you're going to look at you know, fiscal year 14, 15, the level of contribution profit is almost the same five, six years in, right? Which means that either these customers are obviously produced, love the experience of producing a lot, very engaged super fans, and also Naked have the opportunity to now personalize the experience to them, offer them good deals, drive that lifetime value and keep them, you know, drive stickiness with, with these cohorts. But that only happens if you can keep filling the funnel and keeping them. And, and so part of the issue that I had back to your data point is that they should be personalizing the experience as soon as possible, right? Because part of the issue with these things, you lose customers straight away. You might lose 50% of your customers in three, four months. Right. And they, they, they call mature customers after the fifth, fourth or fifth month, which is the second purchase, the second yep. case. So it's, it's that six month period, which, which is crucial. And that goes into like, how do you offer introductory cases? How do you personalize that? How do you know what Andrew you want to purchase? You want to purchase red, white, sparkling, et cetera. Like, how do you know that? And, and over time they will be able to better understand people in this region. Or if you, you know, if you click here or what you say, maybe we can collect data before they offer that introductory case, but it's filling the funnel and, and, and then converting that into the, the second or third case is really the, as with any DTC business, it's, it's really the, really. Yeah, the I, I just wondered, cause like, you know, Naked Wines, again, it comes back, it, it's Kickstarter for wines, right? So it's a little bit different than a meal kit where, hey, we, we need to put in a burger and, uh, you know, a bunch. Like, I do think there is, hey, we're funding wines that aren't going to be made for three to six months or something, right? So I, I do- You're funding Matthias or you're funding, you know, Andrew. You're, you're, I fund, and I, and I tell, and this is the part of the, the psychology, which I think what attracted me to the company was that there's a big psychological element here, an emotional element where, you know, most people, most wine drinkers don't understand how to explain the liquid wine as, as a product, right? But what you can explain is Andrew, your life, where you where your grape is, how you you know produce the wine. The winemakers update the community on the process of their of, of their production. Uh, tell them how to drink it, what to drink it with, you know, how to exp you know, so it's it's I then tell I don't I don't explain the product as wine. I explain your story at the table. But I guess what I was wondering is does naked wine do they have a data advantage because they've got hey 
here's 200 startup winemakers in the past that have pitched their story. We can go and look and say like, oh, here are the, here were the 80 most successful. This is what we look for in winemakers. So actually they've got a sourcing advantage over a startup because a startup doesn't have that advantage, right? A startup actually has to go and source 200 winemakers and then they can say, oh, here's the 80 most successful. And yeah, they could probably kind of look and see what making, but I feel like making's got a big data advantage on that supply side or am I, am I imagining that? I, well, and it, it, it's, it could be data, but it also just is scale. Right. If you're if you're a young if you're a young winemaker or a winery, Naked can agree longer grape contracts and deeper grape contracts. So instead of a startup going and saying, "Okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll fund you for a thousand cases," Naked would go, "Well, you know, I've got here's ten thousand cases because I've got a million angels." Right? Yeah, and I've got data that says, "Yeah, well, the yeah." Uh, I've got a couple more questions, but there was one, they had this really interesting, and I'm sure this is, you know, normal fare for most companies, but they had this really interesting value of a postcard anecdote and their, uh, and your report, I, you and I were talking about a little bit. Do you want, do you want to tell that? I just think it's such an interesting. Where is it? I'm going to, what, what page is it on? I know you mentioned it's, that. Uh, it's page 31 of their annual report. I, I'm happy to, to do it. It was just so interesting. You know, it's typical fare for Googles and stuff, but you very rarely see this for a wine club. I'm happy to go through it if you uh, don't remember it off the top of your head. Um, I'm just putting the page up now. Yeah. But it's just, uh, it, it, I think this is the CEO's letter. And he said, hey, we used to send a letter to all of our new subscribers and angels investors. And actually what we found over time is we switched to a postcard. And we did that because a postcard's cheaper. And we actually discovered our members like it more. And we only send the postcards to 90% of our members because then we have 10% of our members in the control group. And we can see how much the postcard actually improves the retention. And then we're also using that to get all sorts of different data where, hey, females respond to this type of postcard more than males, or maybe, you know, a 75 year old responds to the uh, postcard differently than a 33 year old and stuff. So I just thought that was a really interesting and that, game. And so, and it, and that also, that's just a, a great example of the culture of the business. And that's one thing that, you know, because I'm really skeptical of, of D2C businesses, you know, just generally because of the blue apron. <laughs> and just the, the risk in them and also the you know lifetime value is just you know somewhat doesn't exist to a very specific point and it, you know it's, it's very hard to manage and i think one one thing that i was really worried about and always worried about with d2c businesses is losing control of of that lifetime value and the fact that you can go on like extrapolating lifetime value is is like a recipe for disaster right if you believe that the unit economics of your early customers are the same as your marginal customers yeah. then going to be really in trouble and i think blue apron done that and you can also you know mismatch sp supply and demand right if you get ahead of yourself and acquire too many customers you then can't buy inventory source the source the wine sell the wine and you end up you end up seeing higher churn in your core customer base your existing customers because you can't serve them with the right product yep. so so managing that is is really 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 challenging what i was worried about and the reason the part of back to your postcard example is that when you speak to management you realize that these guys are serious about like understanding data and, and you know it sounds stupid but and everyone and everyone might say that but if you go and look at the way they test and iterate on even small things like you know I guess corkscrew versus top or anything in their product they really look to design everything and test it properly and even nick as well you know, as being the CEO now, he effectively built out all of the analytics division with another guy as well. So that I think is also what I always get, get worried about as well. Losing control of that is just the biggest risk. I think it's when, because it, look, look, if this was Google versus Facebook, this is beyond standard stuff, right? Like this is table six, but it, it was really professional. And I think this is why a lot of growth investors are attracted to this. A lot of wine businesses aren't going to do this, right? I, I, or that's my understanding. I, I would guess a lot of wine businesses aren't doing that. I'm sure like some of the startup wine distributors are doing. But what I like about Naked Wines is they're marrying the, the heavy data analytics focus. And, you know, they're all their annual report is customer lifetime value, retention. How much are we spending on marketing? When things got risky at the bottom of the crisis, like just to be safe, we tried to pull back our marketing spend so that we were getting 5x lifetime value versus 4x on our spend and stuff. And actually, it ended up being 7 or 8x. But you know, I, and you can I, see their cohorts, right? And you can see their cohort charts, which is... That, that data focus is really... It, it, it's not unique for a tech company, but for a wine company, I thought it was interesting, refreshing. It was a really cool story. 
So let me just give a couple more uh, pushbacks on the investment piece and stuff, right? I think the first, I think the major pushback aside from some of the ones we've already covered is the valuation, right? They give a standstill EBIT number, which I do think there are some questions on the standstill EBIT number because of some of the assumptions on refilling the kennel. We can, we can talk about that. But, you know, I think rolling standstill EBIT for the last 12 months is 26 million pounds. Current EV is 450. So you're absolutely not paying a crazy standstill EBIT multiple if you trust their numbers. But I think the biggest pushback people get, I give everything. These guys admit it. They were an insane COVID beneficiary, right? I think standstill EBIT went from 4 million a year ago to 26 million today because people were locked in at home. They couldn't go buy wine. You know, They couldn't go out to restaurants. A lot of people went to Naked Wines and ordered startup wine. And that's great. They've got a much bigger customer base. But a, a lot of people are worried, hey, the moment Andrew can go back to a restaurant, he's going to cancel his Naked Wine subscription because he can go drink wine at a restaurant or he can go kind of peruse a vineyard and stuff. So when you think about these guys from a COVID beneficiary standpoint, how much of this business can they retain? How much do you trust that 26 million in standstill even? I mean, I, I'm less interested in this year. I think, I think it's the same with all these COVID beneficiaries, right? Like there's no doubt going to be some people that churn and, and they're going to lose. But I think it goes back to what you believe, right? Do you believe that there's... Do you believe in the value chain economics that are favorable for what for Naked's model? Do you believe that the scale benefits shared effectively in this model? Do you believe there's a behavioral element that means that customers are going to be stickier to, to the model? So if you believe those three things, then then if you go and look for 2025, it doesn't seem crazy that you can that you can make the valuation work and, and have a have a very you know 30% plus IRR on this. But my numbers, I mean, even 2021, I think if you look at the if you look at the, I mean, H1, so that standstill, num standstill EBIT number 26 million was 12 month rolling, right? With hate from H1. So H1, H fiscal year or H121 is, is March 2020 to, or oh, sorry, September 2019 to September 2020, right? So six months of COVID. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, but then the year before that, you had 10 million standstill EBIT. So they've done over, you know, potentially, um, you know, 15 million roughly plus in, in six months during COVID. And if you look at the, I mean, the core drivers of the, the stands to leave it, whether you want to use that or not. I mean, I just look at free cash flow, to be honest, but you know, it, it's, you look at the repeat contribution margin, the retention and the payback, which is obviously based on the CAC, but I don't think, I actually think you could see a, a, a massive bumper year, these numbers coming up in next, next month or end of this month. But because you know, if you if you think sales retention for the year is is going to be much higher than you know ninety percent, right? Plus, really, um, and you've got higher frequency, bigger bulk purchases. I think you could see upwards of 35, 40 million, even plus of stand to leave bit in two thousand twenty one. Now that doesn't really matter because, like you said, you can lose half those customers. But if you got if you believe in those three things, the industry structure, the shared economies. Of scale and the, the behavior if you look at 2025 numbers which is kind of what i look at the free cash flow there um i don't think it's crazy at all that you can get to you know north of 50 million 55 60 million standstill ebit mm -hmm. on 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 1.3 to 1.5 million angels and and that should give you 30 million roughly plus of, of free cash flow and you're still replenishing the base right Okay, so, so you just, uh, that was my last question. So reasonable bull case skew, uh, well over a million subs, approaching 1.5 million subs, 2025, 2006. You've got 300,000 subscription uh, subscri angels in the UK with 66 million population. So like yep. the US, I don't think it's crazy you can get a million in the US at all. Yep, so you think 2025, 2026, we're talking 1.5 million-ish angel investors, that's going to translate into 50 to 55 million in standstill EBIT and growing. Obviously, at that point, you're talking huge scale benefits, right? Because now you've got a subscription base of a million and a half when you're dealing with one, like you are the gold standard, you can make huge wine contracts, your costs are probably super low. When you think, you know, one of the things with scale is people forget, hey, there's a marketing cost to acquire, there's a mark, there's this marketing cost to acquire and keep subs. And when you're spreading that over a million angel base, you know, I, I use the Netflix. Netflix has 75 million American subs and uh, 
Viacom, I think is around 10 or 15. Netflix, when they market, they scale, scale it over seven times the sub base or something. So exactly, yeah. Same, same with Naked. And I think the way I look at this is I've actually, my 2025 numbers have you know, pretty much sales from the forecast is 68 to 70, well, 65 percent growth from for this year 2021 or for the you know the fiscal year 2021 i've just 20 percent there after to 2025 is gets you to about 1.3 to 1.5 million in angels on the same frequency of purchasing per bottles um because you can back out like a you can back out the the unit economics of of of, of a customer also the 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 dcf if you will um but the i've actually just assumed sales retention declines much lower than one average of 76 percent well one year one payback is you know is the much lower at 60 65 66 percent cac is cac is around 200 you know per angel which is which is about the same where it's at now if not a bit higher um slightly higher and that will give you roughly You'd be growing at six, seven percent angel base in 2025. So you'd be replenishing, but growing also 2025, giving you like 55 million uh, standstill EBIT, which then you can go and look at the cash flow because I think there's some amortization you can include, plus the fact that networking capital, I think, is management guide for like one to two percent of the change in net sales is working capital. Um, so you can back that out and you get you get about 30 million in free cash flow, which is so if I if I'm doing the math in my head right, and please tell me if I'm wrong, because it's tough to do math in your head during a podcast. But you know, based on those economics, I would think uh, the share price right now is what it's seven hundred uh, pounds. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So I mean, well, the 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 I think the market cap is what five ten million EV. They've got seventy five million in cash. So like yeah, talking- so about four fifty. I mean, if I'm doing the math in my head oh. right, you're probably talking about a. 1.2 to 1.5 billion dollar company on that number, maybe even higher if you want to get aggressive on multiple. But so you're you're talking the stock price over three xing in the next four to five years if the if that bull case is right. Is that about what how you're painting it? Yeah, I think so. And, and if you think about like the, I mean, this business has huge negative working capital and and it has like a hundred million net assets, even even lower, right? So you you're basically earning you know 30 percent return on invested capital. No, it, it makes sense. It, the numbers make sense. It, you know, as I was doing this, I was getting, I was getting bullish on the company because I looked at it a couple of years ago, felt like I passed. Uh, I know Elliot's. I, I, can- risks, though. I mean, I, one of the things that I'm worried about in terms of the risks to talk about in more detail is like the. Oh. I just you know when you think about the U.S. and the distributors, I mean, I think they're fairly concentrated with Southern Glazers, Breakthrough, Republic National. I don't know what these guys are going to do. Right? I think yeah. what well, eventually they'll start fighting back. I don't know what, if they'll lobby for regulation or they might try and. You know, that's the regulatory risk I mentioned earlier, right? Like, you, yeah. how can Naked be selling other people's wines at prices lower than what we would, what we could kind of provide a consumer? So but it's, not, it's not other people's effectively, it's theirs, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so. Uh, well, let me, you know, everybody, let, let's end on this. So everybody w- talks about what I like to call level up opportunities, right? Netflix leveled up into making their own content and becoming the biggest player. Um, Amazon used Amazon retail as the thing to fund Amazon Web Services and leveled up into one of the best growth businesses of all time, right? When I think about Naked Wines, you know, my first thought was, oh, could they level up into the alcohol distribution? I don't think that makes sense because of regulatory reasons, at least here in the US, but what are, are there level up opportunities here aside from maybe that one? I mean, I think you mentioned at the beginning where it would be potentially premium wines you know, to begin with, I think you, they're focusing on the sub $30 wine. So you can go into much more expensive, but also higher margin wines for them. And then I think they've tried, I mean, the CFO or the old CFO, now the guy, um, James Crawford, he runs the UK business. He used to work at Diageo. So he knows different, he knows spirits pretty well. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, I think they've also tried beer before, craft beer, but the the economics are the unit economics don't really work because they're lower value for same weight and size. Yep. Um, but spirits could be one they could try. I think, I, I, I think it just depends on like what I wouldn't like to see them go too far into, like you said, you know, selling other products that don't keep the behavioral element of the business model intact. So may, maybe it just new products potentially, but I think just for me, just hopefully they can just nail wine. And I think that should be enough at least for this price yeah. anyway. 
Okay. It's one of those things, the opportunity in front of them is so big, they, they almost don't need to attack or go after any other. But you know, everybody loves, everybody loves level up. I think, it's, I think it's hard though. So, I mean, the one thing that, that come out of the, the interview with, with Nick um, was that, you know, again, comparing Naked with other vertically integrated models is that Naked is effectively a, a, a production company, a distributor and a retailer. That's, that's pretty hard. It's almost like Carvana making the cars and then having their IRCs in the last mile and then like retailing them. Right? So, so managing that is really, really difficult. Managing the inventory, um, you know, distributing the inventory in the right places to the right customers, retailing and marketing. It's like, it's getting that right, I think is just not a mean thing. That's what I'm worried about. Just the execution risk, I think is, is, is pretty high. It's difficult. Perfect, perfect. Anything else on your mind with Naked Minds we should be talking about? Um, I think the one thing that I worry about is just the, the marketing ability of the company, because like you said, that again, if you look at the history of the UK and the Australia and the U S you have a price driven market in UK and Australia. Um, and in the U S you have a much higher average bottle price. So naked's brand equity and the marketing position, it has to be different. And I, and I think that they made a big mistake in going in and saying, we're cheaper than everyone. And then you guys didn't want to drink it all. Right. And, and so I think there's an element of, of how, how, how hard or how long would it take or how difficult is it for, for naked to change the U S consumers perception of the quality of their brand. And I think that's why, to be honest, before, before COVID, I mean, naked one wasn't growing that quickly. Remember? Yeah. It was going pretty slowly. People were skeptical of it. I was skeptical of the product market fit. I still am skeptical of the product market fit to a certain extent. You don't actually truly know how well does this product fit the market. And then COVID has sort of brought that forward and give them a chance, filled the funnel for them to people to test the product. Um, and now it's, 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 it's really up to them to change the perception of the US consumer and say, trust naked. We deliver great stuff. It's not cheap. It's just high quality at an affordable price similar to Costco in a way, right? And, and trying to do that is gonna be very, very difficult. You have to have the right marketing strategy, the right product in the right place, the right introductory boxes for customers and, and not be persuaded by that higher contribution margin that's dangling from the, from the more premium bottles that you could probably go and sell if you wanted to. Yeah. So that is what, what I'm looking at is really just what they do in the US, how they position themselves, how they market themselves how you how you guys feel about the products and the, the stickiness and the retention there but no I, I just love what you said where before COVID they weren't growing and then COVID obviously was this huge show and, and it's just such an interesting case of COVID it does seem like COVID took their business for on the short term it obviously took their business to the next level but it seems like in the medium to long term as well it took their business to the next level because so many people tried their product and were able to see oh you know if it's I'm, good, buying, yeah. I'm buying a $20 bottle of wine from them but it's not a $20 bottle of wine I buy at my liquor store, it's more a $50 or $60 bottle of wine I buy from my liquor store. And it does seem like they've broken some of that down. Uh, you know, I, I do think like- well, and, and the other thing to remember, like is also how the stockers trade as well. So if you look in the, if you look over the last four or five, four years, five years, um, every time Naked reported and they invested through the PL, the stock would crater. It, it, would, it would go down 10, five, 10%, right? Even when it was growing, you know, 5, 10, 15%, angels and, and growth and and i think there is this potential culture change going on at naked now where you had the old retail family majestic is the largest shareholder you know you had that they're, they're slowly liquidating their stake you've got nick devlin now lives in, in in napa cfo is now us they're bringing on new chairman so they are slowly transitioning to become more of a traditional e-commerce d2c play where they can also get the investor base that understands that they are investing through the PL, not through the cash flow statement that they can, you know, the, the, the economic, the way you look at it is different. So I think now what you're going to see, what I would like to see potentially is naked go after the market a bit more aggressively, potentially, um, rather than historically, there's been worries about, oh, they're not actually earning any money. And you, know, you want to see EPS growth and the stock craters every time they grow. So I think there is a transition away from that old, brick and mortar mentality to this more vertically integrated model that the naked really are. Perfect. Perfect. Well, if, that, if it's good with you, I think we'll end it there. Um, you know, I, I, again, I'm a premium, premium beta subbed. I'm a premium beta to, uh, in practice. I've really enjoyed it. 
there's a, a great Naked Wine interview with the CEO from November that I, I think I would encourage anybody who's interested in this to go ahead, sign up to In Practice and uh, go check it out. But Will, it was great having you on. Next time you, you've got another interesting one, we'll, uh, we'll have to have you back on and uh, appreciate it. Looking forward to staying in touch. Thanks for having me, man. All Cheers. right.